Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, Lick Diamonds, <laughs> and special guest... Johnny Kelly. Pasta Johnny That's Kelly. That's right. I love your intro. It's like you're a wrestler. A wrestler. <laughs> this is going to be like a wrestling match here today. So... It, depending on you're watching this on YouTube or listening via the podcast, you might have already seen the title, and maybe you're scratching your head wondering what in the heck are the Salt Strong Bros doing. The title of this is called Salt Strong Unchurched. This is the very first episode, and let me just tell you why we're doing this and, and what our goal with this is. So first and foremost, over the last year, we've done quite a few podcasts, usually about two a week. And every once in a while, I sprinkle in something personal. I talked a lot about my uh, bouts with depression and anxiety and alcohol. Talked about just some things that have happened in life, some suffering, some pain, some times that I felt lost, that that I I felt just confused and unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy, after all the podcasts, and and this whole thing started off as a fishing podcast, the ones that get the most feedback – and the ones that like just give me the goosebumps from some of the emails I've received have been about the personal stuff. And a lot of people have asked, you know, Joe, Joe like, t- I want to know more about this journey. How did you go from like being in the lowest lows where I was afraid to go into Publix? I was suffering from that bad of anxiety attacks and I could not see the end in sight. I felt like there was no hope. I felt like I was alone. I was scared to tell people. And I've received messages now from, you know, from complete strangers that, I mean, just mind-blowing stuff of how some of these messages have changed their life. And so I've thought a lot about this. I've prayed about it. I've talked to members like you. Johnny's one of our insider members. And I kept hearing this whole salt strong unchurched. And here's what unchurched means. Unchurched represents around 65 to 70% of America. So you ain't alone if you're unchurched. And what that means is you probably grew up going to church or maybe you've been in the past and you're not going now for whatever reason. However, you kind of have that itch to go, but either you think it's boring, and we're going to talk about that because a lot of churches are completely boring. No offense, Pastor. No, they are. Uh, We're we're (laughs) going to talk about just the intimidation factor of why a lot of people don't attend church because it can be intimidating. And sometimes you walk into a church and they're already in this 12 week long lesson and you just feel lost and confused and you feel like you don't belong there. And me looking back, just so you know, my history, I did go to church every week as a kid. And quite honestly, they weren't very fond memories. They were memories to me of like having to wear clothes I did not want to wear. (laughs) They were memories of me putting on really uncomfortable shoes. They were memories of me all of a sudden kind of being forced to be an acolyte as a young kid (laughs) and having to put those thick polyester robes on and sweating up there. I just picture you rolling out on Sunday morning in like your brown corduroys. (laughs) That was me, dude. And, was and, I, too. <laughs> and, I, and I grew up in Florida. Like it's, you're hot. Like you don't want to put long pants on and <laughs> dress up, and especially the whole acolyte thing. I, I mean, I I did not enjoy that. And I remember just sweating up there, like trying to knock not knock over the candles or the wine and the bread. And so as I got older, and and let's just take college for instance. I finally you know graduate high school. I go off to college in Atlanta, Georgia. And for me, it was like, finally, I don't have to go to church anymore. And that's me being candid. And I I want this entire series to be just candid and unfiltered, honest, because I I think that's what's missing in a lot of churches and a lot of conversations, right? For sure. I mean, you know, people people respond to uh, people being real and people being honest, and they respond to people talking to you like a normal person. I mean, it's watch movies and, you know, yes, there is a a place to sort of get away from it all. And we watch Avengers or whatever, but, but the the best movies that we remember throughout all of our history are ones that just tell stories from real life. You know, you look at like Forrest Gump or something like that. Like there are these stories of, uh, that that might be a little far fetched, but they're, they're, they're stories of people and they're stories of people that are broken and messed up and just sort of what they go through as they walk through life. And I, I think that's what people need to hear when it comes to the idea of of church and God is that they need to know that there is, uh, that that we're people, that that it's sort of normal and that we can be, uh, not sort of normal. It is normal. It's just a, a part of who we are and, uh, what, what, what I, what I believe and what I think and it, it guides sort of how I operate. But, but in the end, I'm, I'm still a person 
just like everybody watching and listening to this. So, and, and you have an amazing story we're going to talk about here in yeah. a little bit where, you know, I, I think at some point in your life you might have felt a little bit lost and, and broken and, and didn't really have that hope, you know, of, of, hey, what am I doing here? What is my purpose? And, and then we're going to address the whole God thing. Because I think the, the main goal of this is to address a lot of those questions that most of us have. And, and, and even I find myself talking to my wife, you know, we, you know, we moved from Texas to Atlanta, then Tampa, now Winter Haven, and we've always been trying to find a good church community, mm-hmm. and it's been really tough. And a lot of the questions my wife has is like, why, why can't they talk about this? Why can't they tell, you know, hard-hitting real stories? And that's what we want to focus well, on. And here. it's a reasonable question. Uh, it, it's a reasonable question, I think, that, that more churches should dive into because it's – if, if it's the questions that the people they want to, if, if a church wants people to come, uh, you know, and we want people to learn about God and stuff like that, then uh, shouldn't we be answering the questions that they have that are completely reasonable? Yeah. I mean, it's a completely reasonable question to ask, you know, how do I know if God's real? Yeah. Like that's a reasonable question, and it's it's you're, you're not bad for asking it. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, I, I, I believe... You're, it's good to ask those kind of questions. It's smart. It helps you learn. Helps you grow. Uh, you know, I, I believe that you're that God wants people to follow after Him that 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 are doing it because they want to, because they believe it, not because they're forced to or they feel some obligation uh, to be holy or something like that, but to to be normal people uh, that that choose to follow after Him. And in order to do that, it's it's a decision, and it's a decision that has to come from. And understanding and, and saying, hey, you know what, I, I, I believe this because I believe it, yep. uh, you know, not because it was told to me, but but this is what I believe. And 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 despite what some people may think, God is cool with you anywhere on the journey. Like if yeah. you don't know if you believe it yet, that's cool. Yeah. Like that's cool. It's it, the point. It, the point isn't to say uh, you have to be here or you're evil or you're bad, but it's that. It's asking those questions and going, hey, you know what? I want to learn. I want to. I want to get better. I want to have a, a deeper understanding of this kind of stuff. Yep. So, and, and church can be fun, right? I think. Yes. You mentioned it earlier. A lot of people think of it, including me, for many, many, many years. It was more of an obligation. It was something I checked off the box. I felt a little better going. And so many of us, because church can be completely boring right? And mm-hmm. you don't get much out of it. They'll pass by a hundred or maybe 200 churches to go to an NFL game, right? Like, you know, mm-hmm. here in Winter Haven, we used to go to Tampa Bay Bucks games back in the day. We had season tickets. We drive an hour, hour and a half with traffic, you know, to sit there. And now, of course, you have to go through x-ray machines and all this traffic and long lines and $8 beers and cover your kids' ears because so many people are cursing. And yet we'll do all that stuff and then sit through the traffic and we won't go to church because NFL football is entertaining. It's fun. Yeah. And yet we think of church as like, all right, kind of have to go. And, and it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that's a no. big goal. Of, of this pot, and I know you do that at your church too, yeah. is just make it fun. Make it where people are excited to come back, where they can they can hear stories, they can feel emotion, right? Yeah, I want church to be, I know for us, for my church, that we have, uh, you know, our services are around an hour, so it's not like three hours or yeah. whatever. It's about an hour. You have some good music, a great band, uh, fun lesson. Uh, but, but it also, in the midst of being funny and fun, it still is a, a lesson or a message that is going to uh, hopefully help answer your questions or, or even better yet, lead to more questions so that you can walk further in this journey without questions you don't learn. You know, there's a reason why you raise your hand in class. You know, you, you have to learn and you, you want to grow and you don't necessarily grow by just somebody just telling you everything, but but by figuring it out, you know, uh, you know, by figuring out what you believe, why you believe it, um, you'll never be as strong uh, in in who you are as a person until you know what you believe and you know why you believe it. Ever, I mean, you'll never be as strong as you are in that moment, and and that's the journey. That's that's the journey. I love it. Yeah. And so we're going to talk all about that in one second. I'm I wrote down some notes because there's still people probably scratching their heads saying, "All right, what, <laughs> what is this?" So here's what I wrote down quite some time ago on what Salt Strong Unchurched is. And it was meeting the unchurched, the 65 to 70 percent of Americans mm-hmm. who were not going, but yet they they feel like they're lost and they feel like they want to to be a belong and want to be a part of something. It's meeting them where they are with honest and unfiltered answers to the big questions that we all have about faith in general. Mm-hmm. And um, 
here, here are the ultimate goals, and then we'll get into your story. So I think for the people that are feeling despair, that are feeling discouraged, that are feeling depressed, I mean, all the things that I personally went through and, and are just looking for hope. I, I, I think hope is a word that we that at the end of this, we hope people feel like, you know what, there is hope. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one struggling with all these stuff, whether it be addictions or bad relationships, et cetera. And then just that unfulfillment. I, I, I feel like hearing the messages and knowing what I went through at my lowest lows, I felt so unfulfilled, meaning I felt like I had no purpose, I had no mission. Why was I why was I put here on this earth? And I and I did not like God at the time of my life. I was not going to church, and those were my lowest lows. Mm-hmm. And then finally, you know, just that confusion and, and clarity and, and what I had to do when when I was at that lowest low, in this point I was drinking every night because it was my only friend. My wife was working crazy hours in a hospital. I hardly saw her. I had zero relationship with her. I had no friends because I was traveling all the time in a new city in Houston. And Houston's not, no offense to my Houston friends, but. <laughs> I used to live out there. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a tough place to live, especially from Florida. And I did not really want to be there. And so I, I drank every night. I was overweight. I, that was when the anxiety attacks and stuff were at all-time high depression. Like, And what I started doing was I started looking at it. it it, people I looked up to, people like my parents who was like, you know what, man, how can I be like them? And what was interesting, the one common thread that all these people had, I meaning they had great marriages, they, I, no one's perfect. And I think that's another misconception about Christians. Oh, they're all perfect. God, they're all broken. They all have, mis- they all have complete screwed up lives for the most part, right? I, no, yeah, I, you know, completely. I mean, <laughs> there's not a single person in history that isn't messed up. Yes. <laughs> like, but everybody. The difference is what I found with all those people that truly had faith, that truly had a relationship with God and like believe with all of their heart they all seem to let the stuff just kind of slide off their backs. Like even my parents who, you know, my youngest brother in the wheelchair, I don't know how it, 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 it breaks up more families than anything else. And yet it brought them closer together, like all these things. And, and a lot of my parents' friends, all of them had that one, that one theme in common mm-hmm. is when, when, t- when tough times happen and it's going to happen to everyone. I mean, from death to, to, uh, to you two de- depressing times. I mean, there's always suffering going on in our lives, but they all had that one theme in common, which was a, rela- a relationship with God. And so let, let's go into that. Yeah. And I w- I'd love to hear your story. You shared it with me one time a while back, and I remember getting like goosebumps just hearing about the whole journey. <laughs> and I, and I, I want you to tell one, because I think a lot of people are going to relate to it in, mm-hmm. a, in a sp- certain way. And two, I think it brings pastors in general down from a pedestal or a, you know, <laughs> You know, from please oh, don't put me on a pedestal. But you know what it's I'm the saying. The last I'll, place I want to be. You yeah, know, but when you told me that, you became real to me, and 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 I could relate to you. And yeah, which is why I wanted you to be the first guest on this on this podcast. Yeah, you know, uh, my story. I uh, I grew up as a pastor's kid. My my dad is a lifelong kids pastor. Uh, so he he's a minister with with to kids. Him and my mom working together, uh, uh, ministering to kids. You'll never meet somebody that loves families more than my dad and my mom. And, uh, and so I grew up with that, you know, it's been cool, you know, now here we are years and years later and and I've hired him. He's now the kids pastor for me at my church, uh, where I pastor at. And, um, but I grew up in the church my whole life, but I also grew up in the church that, uh, a lot of us, if we did go to church as kids probably grew up in, which was, uh, sort of a myopic view, a very, uh, the wrong view of what God really wanted the church did, to be. Did you think it was boring like I did? I, I thought it was boring, but it, it was also, it was legalistic. It was, mm. it was a, a, a many times condemning. Um, you know, you were, you, you, you lived in fear of doing the wrong thing and, and, and missing heaven. Because, you know, whatever, you get in a car wreck on the way home and, and you had just done a sin. <laughs> and you, you, you lived in this, this sort of weird stage of like, God loves me, but I'm scared. Um, and, and so I grew up in that and, and, and lived in the church my whole life. Grew up doing that. And, uh, and we moved from Illinois. Uh, I grew up in Texas. Uh, go Cowboys. And uh, <laughs> sorry for your bucks this weekend. Uh but I, I grew up in Texas, and uh, but my dad's job and work had taken us to a church in Illinois, um, and we moved away from Illinois uh, heading into my junior year of high school. So I was 16, and uh, we moved to Lakeland, uh, where I live now, 
Pol- in Polk, Polk County. Polk County. Uh, we, 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 we moved to Lakeland when I was 16, and uh, my dad went to work at another church there in Lakeland. And um, when, we, when we did, I uh, discovered that the, the school I'd been at in Illinois was, uh, I, I was really far ahead. Uh, and so we moved here at the beginning of my junior year, and I went to school for like two months and met with the guidance counselor and they go, you know, you have enough credits to graduate. They're like, you can stick around for a couple of years. I said, no. <laughs> and so I, I, I graduated. I was done with school and I was 16 years old. And, uh, right. and, and my parents looked at me and they said, you know, we know it's early. We weren't expecting anything. And so if you want to just sort of experience life, get a job or whatever for the next couple of years, you can and so a week later, I joined a rock and roll band. <laughs> yeah, 16. Uh, yeah, okay. I, 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 I was uh, 16, uh, yeah, almost 17 when I joined the band. Uh, and, uh, and I joined a, a rock and roll band playing bass. And it was a Christian band. Um, I met some guys at other Christian concerts. I was really, I, I, was, if, 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 I was a big punk rock kid. Yeah. Uh, so I had a, a big mohawk at different times. Seriously, so and, this was like a I, punk Christian band? Yes, okay. and so I had... I've had many piercings all over, and, uh, and, 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 you know, the band was sponsored by a tattoo parlor, and so I was, that's what, <laughs> it was fun, you know, being a Christian band, but thanking a tattoo parlor in our albums, uh, uh, but we, uh, so I, I, I joined a rock band, and uh, we started playing concerts, and it was really cool, it was fun, and, um, and did that for a couple years, and, 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 and the band ended up breaking up, and in, in that moment, I, 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 I wasn't mad at God. I think that's sort of a, a distinction that, that, that people have because a lot of people feel like they've walked away. Maybe they grew up in the church and they walked away and they just don't know how to get back. Um, and, and, and I walked away. I wasn't mad. I wasn't angry. I joined another band and um, it wasn't a Christian band. It was just a rock and roll band. And uh, I wasn't angry. I wasn't mad. I just sort of said, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to experience life. So you, outside you, of that, when you say so, walked away, you mean you stopped going to church? Stop going to church. Okay. Stop going to church. I stopped really thinking about it. Okay. Um, I just sort of it. I wasn't mad at God. I wasn't hurt. Um, it wasn't, isn't to say that I haven't had hurts that came, you know, from people at churches and things like that. Uh, I think it's an important distinction. A lot of times we equate God with the people that hurt us at a church, and, and those are two totally different things. But I, I wasn't mad. I wasn't angry. And I sort of said, you know what, I'm just going to sort of experience life otherwise. And, and I started doing that and, and where it led me was not a great place. Um, you know, you cut to a few years later, uh, a couple bands later. And, uh, I remember I was doing a lot of drugs, doing a lot of drinking. Um, I was on tour, uh, on, on, this, on this particular tour. It was the last tour. It, we were one night we were in Indianapolis and we played a, a set at a club there in Indianapolis. And afterwards, I, I don't remember anything, uh, until the next morning, uh, when the band found me, <laughs> uh, they found me, uh, behind the dumpster of the club <laughs> that we, we played at the night before they'd been looking for me all night. Cause I didn't come back to the hotel. Uh, and I just gotten drunk or high or both. <clears throat> and uh and I don't I don't really know what all happened but that's where they found me and uh and 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 I remember uh just going man life sucks right now it just did it just wasn't fun uh you know and, and I was doing I was touring I was in a rock and roll band and I was you know people were cheering and loving the music and I'm I'm uh you know getting to drink and get high for free uh, you know, uh, for a lot of people, that might be their dream. And were you still in the <clears throat> late teens at this point? No, no. At this point, I was in my early 20s. Okay, okay. And so this is a few years later, you know, in, 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 uh, and I remember uh, we were on that tour. It was the same tour. And about a week later, uh, part of the tour fell apart. And so we had two weeks of the tour that just sort of fell apart. Uh, and we didn't know what was going to happen. And, and, we could have sort of tried to keep going, but we had basically a two week gap in the middle of a, th- it was a three month tour. We had a two week gap in the middle of it. And we were in, uh, Illinois somewhere by chance. And, uh, it's, so we called the record label and we're, we're like, we just fly us home for two weeks and we'll come back and pick up the, the tour bus and we'll head on to the next show. And as we're pulling into the airport, 
in Chicago, I decided, I, for, and it was for no apparent reason, I called the record label and said, hey, instead of getting me a plane flight, get me a car. I lived an hour and a half from here for years. I went to high school. It's where I went to church. Yeah. Uh, it's where I really made my first ever decision to really live for God. But your family wasn't there. Okay. Nobody's there. Okay. Uh, they're all in tech. They're all in uh, Florida okay. at the time, and so I'm in Illinois. And I, so they rent me a car, and I get in the car, and I drive, and I'm just, I'm not even really thinking much about it. And I drive, and I, I end up in Rockford, Illinois, where I had grown up. And as I'm pulling into town, I'm like, I, I remember distinctly remember pulling in and seeing the sign like for Rockford. I go, yeah, Rockford. What the crap am I doing here? <laughs> like. Why did I come here? I haven't been here in years. I am not the same. I do not go to church. I'm not, I, I'm not living for God. I am, I, you know, I'm not the same guy I was. And, 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 and there are people I still knew there. Obviously I'd grown up there, but, um, I, I didn't know what to do. And, and I basically pulled into town and, and holed up in, in, in a hotel and didn't call anybody for two days. <clears throat> didn't let anybody know I was there. Didn't do any of that stuff. I was just in this random town, basically, and, and I just and you felt like like it was I it felt a, completely alone. I felt like uh, why, why did you do it in the first place? I don't know. Okay, uh, it, it really, honestly, I don't. I, I, it, you know, the best this, the best thing I can tell you, and it might not be an answer that satisfies everybody, but it was God led me to that moment. Um, you know, He watched me hit the bottom. He watched me at rock bottom and he just sort of said, you know what? I'm going to throw a lifeline to Johnny. I'm going to, I'm going to, and I, I truly believe this, that he, he sort of said, you know what? Let's, let's make a couple of these weeks of tours go away. Uh, mm -hmm. and let's, let's see if he goes back home. And that's what I did. And, and it was, I, I was at bottom. I was alone and I went to the closest place that had ever been home to me, which was Rockford, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I went there and for about two weeks, I didn't or about two days, I didn't say anything to anybody. And finally, I ran into a guy who was one of the pastors at the church I had grown up with. And this is a guy that I had known when he was interning at the church. He's just a couple years older than me. And he's a pastor there now, and, or it was then. And, and uh, we ran into each other. And, uh, and it was just sort of out of the blue. And he's like, what are you doing? And I, and I didn't really get into everything. I said, well, I just sort of decided to come into town and see people and stuff like that. He's like, well, I haven't heard that you were in town. I haven't seen you. Like, well, I haven't seen anybody yet. <laughs> you're the first person. And I'm seen. like, you're the first one. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, well, and he didn't even really question. He, I think he realized that, that I was uh, pretty vulnerable at that moment. Like I, I felt alone. I really, I felt alone. Uh, and it was through my own doing. I sort of walked away from everything that would have made me not feel alone. And, uh, and he said, where are you staying? I told him and he said, no, 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 you're staying at my house with me and my wife. And so, I went and slept on their couch and um, it just so happened that they were having sort of a week of, of church services at the church. And so if, in order for me to see anybody or hang out with anybody, I had to go to church yeah. and, um, and I went and it, I wasn't uncomfortable. I'd grown up in it. So it was, it's an easy, it was an easy, you know, sport coat and corduroy pants to slip on. It was an easy walk in there, uh, but I didn't change who I was. And, uh, and I walked in and, sat there and um and I saw who was my youth past the the, the 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 person who was my youth pastor growing up and um her name was Jeannie Mayo it was her name and and I grew up with Jeannie and she was my youth pastor and it was a huge youth group a massive youth group one of the biggest ones in the nation and um and she saw me and just gave me a big hug and said you know why don't you let's go to lunch tomorrow I said okay and uh, she told me where to meet her and uh, we got there and I walked in first and and as she's walking up and I go, I, you know, uh, they said, how many? And I go, two, smoking, please. And I, I made her go sit in the smoking section and I sat there smoking <laughs> while I'm talking to her. And uh, <clears throat> never said anything, just loved on me. And she said, come to church tonight. Come to church tonight. I want you to sit by me. And, and that might not seem like a big deal, but it was a big deal. There's, it's a, a massive church and, uh, you know, there's, you know, a thousand people in this room. And she made all of her pastors move down so I could sit on the front row next to her. So not, not in, not so that I was, you know, like to be a, a, a symbol of anything, but throughout the night and throughout the rest of the week, every single time I was around, everybody just loved me and they just showed me grace and said, Hey, we love you. They, they never, they didn't try to change me. Um, because that shouldn't be the goal of church to change you. The, the goal of church should be to, to show you God, what he's like. 
and hopefully you want to change yourself to be better. And that's really what happened. And so for a week, God showed me grace in a way I had never seen, showed me love and, uh, and it changed my life. I, I, I decided that, you know what, it's time to start following after God again. I uh, met up with the band the next week and sort of said, uh, like, this is my last tour. I'm done. I'm going to finish up this tour and I'm done. Wow. And uh, I've been in full-time ministry ever since. So uh, whatever, going on 18, 19 <laughs> years now, I'm, I'm older than I look. Uh, and that, that's what led led to the life of me being a pastor and being in ministry was was people not trying to change me, but instead just sort of saying, hey, God loves you. We love you right where you're at. Um, you know, here's grace, you know, you're, you're broken. We're broken. Uh, we've just got a God that loves us in the midst of it. And he wants to love you too. So I mean, that's awesome, by the way. So I'm curious, cause I think a lot of people really struggle with, I, I heard from God <laughs> and a lot of people will say, what does that even mean? Uh, and I've heard people who, you know, we had, um, uh, Kelly, who was on uh, on the podcast talking about her son, where, I mean, she was seeing messages from, you know, her son as an angel or God, like on billboards, like yeah. crazy stuff, like literally speaking mm-hmm. to her, the same billboards that she'd seen a million times were saying stuff that was normally not on there, like almost like mm-hmm. unexplainable and then visions. And just like, just the same reason I'm doing this podcast, I, I am trying not to, I, I don't want to be doing this, by the way, like it is uncomfortable, <laughs> right? It's not something that yeah. we ever set out to do. And yet every time I, I reject it and say, oh, I'm going to put it off. Like I, I keep, I feel that tug. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yeah. But I haven't seen like God come down or in a dream and a Jesus up in front of my bed saying, here's what you need to do. But I, I feel like I keep getting pointed in this direction mm-hmm. and it's tough to explain to someone, but I, I it can is feel tough. it in my body. So when you're going through all this, did you have a, like, uh, like h- how do you go from being in a rock band, I guess is the <laughs> unbelievable part and smoking and drinking and drugs to all of a sudden saying, you know what, my path, my purpose, my mission is now to be a pastor. It, you know, it, it, it was, you know, it was never a, you know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail moment where, the paper clouds opened and God yeah. spoke and talked to me. I never had that. Uh, it was it was simply people who uh, were living a life for God uh, showed me his love. Uh, it was honestly just me making the decision to go, you know what, God, you've given me a certain set of gifts, the ability to talk, the ability to communicate, the ability to um, understand. And, and you've also in a weird way, given me a history and a past that is checkered, (laughs) that is messed up, that is broken, that lets me understand where people that are broken in this world are coming from. You know, I understand what it's like to need, you know, a substance or want a substance. I understand what it's like to feel completely and utterly alone. Um, And so because of that, I, I, I think... God speaking to me was, was more, um, just general guidance, just sort of going, Oh wait, um, here's the door that's opening. And every door that I have chosen before has led to brokenness. It's led to hurt. It's led to pain. It's led to, um, depression, uh, uh, feeling completely alone. Uh, you know, cause that's really honestly where it came down to as I felt alone. I, you know, all that let, you know, came from, I, I felt completely by myself. Um, and because I had chosen to walk away and not live the life that God wanted me to. And, uh, and so because of that, I, I was alone and, and he opened the door and said, Hey, here's a place where you're not alone. Here's people that want to do life with you. Mm-hmm. And they're not trying to make you be different or better. They want you to be different. They want you to be better. Not because they think that you're horrible, but because they see that you're sad. They see that you're hurting. They see that you're broken. And they know that that the hope that they feel in their heart is something that would change that in your life. And that's really what it it came down to. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a uh, moment there was, you know, there was none of that. It was, it was, it was seriously just people being there for me, loving me, uh, you know, it's, and it's, it's how I try to be as a pastor. You know, if, 
it, when somebody's hurting or needs something, you know, hey, I'm there for them. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll make phone calls. I'll, I'll say, hey, I, you know, I'll talk. I'll do anything like that. But it all comes down to just being able to say, you know what, I, I'm there for you because that's what changed my life was somebody saying, hey, I love you. I'm here for you. Uh, and and by the way, the reason I'm here for you is because God changed me, and it he, he made me a person that wants to be there for you. And so it's really sort of the, the, the way that, that went down. Love it. Do you, do you mind sharing? There's another story you told me about weight. Uh, you yeah. You overweight at some point because a lot of a, people have struggled. I, I was mean, a big boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was a big boy. I, uh, I struggled my whole life with weight, um, you know. Uh, and so uh, in my highest – I couldn't tell you my highest because I, I, I sort of got – depressed and quit weighing myself yeah. uh i know i i hit like 310 ish i know and you're that. not a t- super tall guy no offense uh, no right? no i'm you're... like 510 511 yeah no i was i was i was a big guy um and it so i was and i'd always struggled with it. i'd never been able to <clears throat> lose my weight and uh and this is this is years after all of the the story i just said and, and i was youth pastoring i was a youth pastor with with teenagers and stuff uh down in miami uh i had Ended up there after a few years. I, I, I youth pastored in New Mexico for a while, and then I was in Miami. And uh, I was down in Miami, and uh, and my pastor decided he wanted to do uh, a, a series of messages that he was going to call the, – the title of the series was going to be called Get Fit. And it was the idea of, like, <laughs> like spiritually – Aimed at you? <laughs> and, uh, no, it was aimed at himself. Uh, we, we were all a little big at the, on that staff, <laughs> you know, a bunch of biggins. And uh, – and I, uh, uh, you know, big boned. Yeah, was, of course. Yeah, it was big boned, husky. Uh, and and I, uh, he, you know, it was the idea of the series was just to like, hey, help you get fit spiritually, like, be able to like, uh, you know, get to a place where where you were more uh, healthy spiritually. And uh, <clears throat> but we decided to do something fun as the pastoral staff. And so this was right when the biggest loser, remember that TV show? Oh yeah. Uh, it was huge at the moment. And this was, this was, you know, uh, quite a few years ago and it, it was a newer show. It had only been out for like a year or two and it, everybody, everybody watched it. Yeah. I mean, it was just a mass, everybody in massive shows, probably <laughs> a little, uh, you know, uh, no pun intended. Uh, it, it was a massive show. Everybody wanted to watch it. And so we, uh, decided to do a biggest loser contest between the pastors for the whole series uh, of sermons. So it was a month or five weeks, I think. And we would weigh in every Sunday morning at the pulpit wow. during church, which is motivation. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. And so I decided to, uh, I, I had bad knees. I'd had, I've had surgery on both my knees. And um, so running wasn't really in the cards for me. And, uh, and so one of the kids in my youth group, her dad uh, was a manager of a, a giant bicycle shop in Miami and like road bicycles. And, uh, I had started trying to ride a bike and I, all I had was like a full suspension mountain bike. And if you're like with shocks on both sides and which they're hard to ride anyways, and they're built for one specific purpose. And it's not riding the streets of Miami when you're 320 pounds. <laughs> I can't imagine what it looked like. This thing sort of bouncing down the road. Um, and so I went to his shop and he hooked me up with a, a road bike and I started cycling and I fell in love with it. So I started biking and I started losing weight and losing weight. And I, lo- I lost a lot of weight, um, uh, over the course of the next few months and, uh, and, and was able to sort of get fit in, in, in that journey. I, uh, I decided to do something a little different. A group of pastors had done it before and I was going to do it, which was to try and get my teenagers excited about making a difference in the world um and thought well what could I use to do that and the thing I thought was what about bicycling you know the idea of doing something makes a difference that if you want to make a difference in the world like nobody's ever changed the world for the better like sitting on their couch eating Funyuns like you know <laughs> you don't ever change the world like that you gotta you gotta get out and do something it's you, disappointing it, yeah I know <laughs> I love Funyuns uh Salty goodness. I, uh, <laughs> but you know, you, you, you have to get a little uncomfortable if you want to make a difference in the world. Mm. You know, I mean, you got uncomfortable when you started salt strong. I mean, you, you've talked about that many times, you know, yeah. you, for a year, you guys were like, uh, and I'm probably still at moments, you know, oh, no, hey, you this, know. this morning before this, was uncomfortable. <laughs> I wanted to call you and cancel. Yeah. Like, this is, 
it's you know, and so uh, nobody ever changes the world unless they're they get a little uncomfortable. I mean, yep. nobody ever. I mean, you got to do something that takes you out of your comfort zone. And so I was like, I'm going to cycle. I'm going to do this. And, and, and I wanted to teach the teenagers like, Hey, you can make a difference in the world. And, and so I started cycling and filming like videos uh, similar to what you guys do with salt strong or other like YouTubers. And this was way years before there were YouTubers. Yeah. Uh, I was putting the videos on YouTube and, and they were these just videos of, uh, me training, getting ready. They were funny, you know, I had, uh, you know, but they would also have like a lesson about how, how you can get out and make a difference in the world. Uh, like I had a video of me like shaving my legs because when you ride a bike a long time, you know, you see the guys, they shave their legs. I tried waxing them on a video oh my and that gosh. was really dumb. And uh, <laughs> it was painful, but I, I, it was very smooth though. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, so I started doing that and then decided to do a ride and, and I was going to ride from the border of Georgia all the way down A1A uh, Beachfront Avenue uh, oh, yeah. to Miami. And uh, and it was 500 miles. I was going to do it in five days. So 100 miles a day. Okay. And I was going to make a video blog every single day doing it. And um, and I did. And it went really well. And beyond my church, other churches started watching the videos and talking about it. And I got asked to go and speak at some of their churches. It's like, how much weight did you lose? I had that. lost, well, at that point, it wasn't my smallest. I, I probably had lost 60 pounds at that okay, point. Wow. I was probably like 250-ish. Um, and so the next year, I did another bike tour like that, another little five-day tour. That time, it was from like Panama City to Fort Myers, okay. down the other coast. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, at, and during that time, I, I felt, I, once again, I felt God. I just sort of felt like, wait a minute there's something bigger here because other churches were following other uh, people that just weren't even part of churches were watching these videos and they were messaging me going, man, you've really motivated me to, to lose weight, but you've also motivated me to get out and make a difference in the community, uh, in the world that, that, that changing the world is not about changing the other side of the world. It's about changing your world. I mean, it's about changing where you live and, and, and you know, uh, just doing something that helps other people, you know, even if you're in a not great place, you know, when I started this, that journey, I was just starting to lose weight. I was not in a great place mentally. I was, I, I, I felt defeated by my weight. Um, and it, it ended up getting to a place where I was seeing people start to change things and do stuff differently. And that's what led to me starting the ministry. I left the church and I started a ministry called Bike for the Light. Mm. And so that was sort of the journey that led me to that place and decided to sort of make the bike this bike journey, something a lot bigger than just my youth group or my church, a lot bigger than five days a year and decided to do it full time. So I sold everything I owned. Wow. Uh, I bought uh, the crappiest little RV that I could have afforded. It was, it was a, it it was a, it was a 1986 Toyota Dolphin. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It was, uh, they don't make them like that. Oh man. No. And there's a reason, uh, it had the, (laughs) And then, you know those old Toyota trucks, the little four little four cylinder trucks. Yeah, that was the truck front end and this giant fiberglass rear end on it called a dolphin. Uh, and there was I don't know why they called it a dolphin. It was brown and barely moved. Like like <laughs> seriously, like uh, you know it'd be like calling your Indy car like like a porpoise or <laughs> or like a, a turtle. Like it was just the the oddest thing in the world. It was called the dolphin, and uh, and. Uh, I got a guy who was going to drive the RV for me. I was going to live in it and we'd go around the country and I would bicycle from church to church telling my story yeah. and just talking about how God wants to use them to make a difference. And, um, and so that's what happened. That's how I started that journey into that area of, of life and, and, and biking and doing all that stuff. And so, uh, sold everything I owned. Uh, and then I jumped in this RV and the, the guy who was going to drive the RV for me had been a part of, he was now an adult, but he had been a part of my youth group when I youth pastored in New Mexico. So I was going to drive to New Mexico, pick him up, and we were going to drive to San Francisco to start the first tour. Um, I, I jumped in the RV, drove to New Mexico. I was excited, you know, had, you know, just, I was pumped. Yeah, like new, a new chapter. A yeah. new chapter in life, you know, I... During the process of starting it, I met my wife, but we were just dating at the time. So I didn't have kids. I didn't have a wife. You know, I'm in my 
late twenties and I'm like, I sold everything I own. Everything I own is in this crappy RV and I'm going down the road and I'm going to, I'm going to, the Toyota Dolphin. We named it Gertie. Uh, <laughs> we put it on the front of it. G E R T Y Gertie. Um, and decided I was going to ride my bicycle across the country for the next nine months. Uh, sort of zigzagging. It wasn't like a straight shot. A lot of people do those like, like, Hey, we're going to do it as quick as we can. I wasn't doing that. I was going to sort of zigzag, go all over the country. Okay. Um, and so I, uh, was excited even though I was nervous. I was uncomfortable. I, I had a few hundred dollars in my bank account from selling everything. And that was it. Like that was wow. it. Like I had enough money in gas to get me to California to start. And I was just sort of believing that, okay, God, you're going to handle this. You're going to make, I feel like you wanted me to do this. So I'm going to take the step. And, um, and so I pick him up in New Mexico and we're excited. Like, okay, we're driving. And so we get about, we get down the road, we're heading towards California now and we drive like two hours and we hear, boom, I'm like, what is he, Gertie? What did you do? And we pull over to the side of the road and the bumper <laughs> on the back of the RV had broken off, uh, partially like it had broken off to where it was dragging on the ground, which sort of funny like by itself like the idea of like the bumper broke and it's dragging out of nowhere but the problem with that is that we had a hitch that was the hitch that we had was mounted on the bumper hmm. uh and the hitch had a bike mount on it and so i had four bicycles hanging all four of my bicycles that i was going to ride on this tour were hanging on the back of that bumper so when it broke and drug it drug all four bicycles down the highway. And so it destroyed all eight wheels, both wheels on all four bikes. Like all, done. G- like done, done. Like some of them were like tacoed, like folded in half. Wow. But all of them were like ground flat on one side. Like they weren't fixable <laughs> in any way. And it broke a few other things, but the big deal was the, the wheels. And, and I'm sitting there, and I remember standing on the side of the highway going, I maybe have enough money in the bank to buy one set of like cheap, bad, not good wheels because wheels for road bikes are expensive. Yeah. And I'm like, I might have like money for one. And, and I, I said, I, but then I don't have any gas money. And I remember standing on the side of the highway out in the middle of the like high desert in New Mexico going, God, is this it? Am I done? I felt like you wanted me to do this. I sold every, I, I quit my job. I sold everything I own. It's all in a junky RV and I'm in the middle of the desert and I'm done. And uh, about that time, my mom oddly uh, called me and, and she said, Hey, I, w- I want you to read uh, a verse, a few verses from the Bible. And it was in Jeremiah chapter one. And, and, In Jeremiah chapter one, basically Jeremiah, God has called him to go do something, to go tell some people about him. God has said, hey, Jeremiah, I want you to go tell people about me. Uh, Not totally dissimilar from what I was doing. And Jeremiah felt like he was too young, like he didn't have enough knowledge, like he didn't understand enough, like he wasn't ready. You know, he felt like a lot of us feel like, like I'm not good enough. Uh, And that's the way I felt at that moment. And in, in, in the first chapter of Jeremiah, God basically says, Jeremiah, just go do what I told you to do. I've got it handled. Mm. Like, I'm going to take care of you. And so in that moment on the side of the highway, I went, all right, God, we've got this. Like, I, I had this sort of, like, you know, like that second wind, like when you're like, all right, you know, I have faith that you're going to handle this. We're going to do it. So we picked up all four bicycles and put them in the RV. We picked up the bumper and put it in the RV and we uh, started driving again. And at this point, we're almost more excited than we were before it happened because we're like, God's going to do something just, cool. Just because of this verse. That, just because of this simple verse that just sort of went, hey, I've got it handled. It, and did your mom know that? No, she didn't know what was okay. going on. She just sort of said, I want you to, I want you to hear this. Wow. And it was just sort of out of the blue. Uh, like talking about hearing from God, like yeah. it, it doesn't always come in a giant booming voice. Sometimes it's your mom calling you (laughs) and saying, I have a Bible verse for you. Uh, That's sort of what can happen. And so I, I got in RV and we're excited. We're going on the road. And about two hours later, uh, we're, we're pumped. We're like, God's going to do something cool. This is going to be awesome. We're going to do something different. Um, And all of a sudden the transmission and Gertie started slipping. (laughs) No, the dolphins like, it started sounding like a dolphin. And so, uh, 
and I, we, I remember we hobbled into, uh, I don't remember the name of the town, but a little town in Arizona. And we got there. So still a long way from San Francisco. Long way from San Francisco. <laughs> and this is on uh, Wednesday night. Wednesday night. And my first service is Sunday morning in San Francisco. Okay. And so Wednesday night. And we pull in. And I remember that night going, okay, I'm still going to keep this energy from this verse. Like, God, I know you're going to do something cool. This isn't a big deal. There's just some gunk in that transmission. I'm believing it. And I walked in that next morning because we parked and slept overnight in the parking lot of this transmission shop. And uh, the next morning walked in, first thing, said, all right, flush it and fill it. And they go, what? And they go, flush the transmission and fill it. There's some gunk in there. It's causing it to slip. And they went, all right. And <laughs> they take it back. And about 30 minutes later, they say, Mr. Kelly, could you uh, come back here? Which is like, is never good. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, we, want, want to, we, we want you to see something. We want you to see something. There's, <laughs> they've ne- there's never been a, a, a mechanic that walked back, you see how pristine this is? I just wanted you to see how good your engine is. Uh, I walked back there, and they're like, you see that right there? And I go, you mean all that shiny stuff? And they're like, yeah, that's metal. It flakes in your oh. transmission pan. And I go, oh. And they go, this transmission's shot. And I go, so you can't flush it and fill it. And they go, no, man, you need a new transmission. And I go, all right. Well, what's that mean? And they go, well, there's – and they said to me, they said, Johnny, there, there, there are two transmissions uh, in the whole country that are available that fit – only two that are available for sale that fit your RV right now. And I go, okay. And they go, so what we would do is just rebuild yours instead. We could rebuild yours and I go, well, how long would that take? And they go, we can probably have you out of here at the end of the closing on Saturday. Okay. Which would basically mean I wouldn't make my first service, the place that I really felt God was leading me to go to. And I said, well, give me a minute. Let me go walk around. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm walking around this parking lot and I'm going, first off, I don't have enough money. Now, I could have called my parents or called some friends and be like, loan me some money. Like, help me do this so I can fix this. Uh, and I remember just walking around this parking lot going, God, this I, like I I don't have any wheels to ride the bicycle. I don't have a vehicle to live in, let alone uh, get me to the place where I'm going to start. And this sort of this feeling of I'm not good enough, depression, like everything I do is a screw up. Like honestly, it's what it felt like, and it overcame me. And I sat down in this parking lot in Arizona, and I opened up my Bible, and I opened back up to Jeremiah chapter one again, and I read it again. Mm where God said, don't worry about it. I got it handled. And I walked into that transmission shop and I go, flush it and fill it. And they looked at me like I was insane. (laughs) They go, you're (laughs) nuts. Like, what are you doing? And I said, no, just flush it, get the gunk out, get all the metal shavings out and fill it up with fresh fluid for me. And they go, we can't let you do that. And I go, I'll sign whatever. And they made me sign papers saying I wouldn't sue them or whatever. And, uh, and we hit the road at a, Top speed of 30, like, four miles an hour. <laughs> you were that guy. We couldn't go any faster. So we couldn't take the highway the rest of the way. So we took back roads from, like, somewhere in the middle of Arizona all the way to San Francisco. Uh, except once we got into California, we had to take the grapevine. If you've ever been to California, there's a giant mountain out of L.A. heading up over the mountains. Into, and we had to take the highway. And we were literally, like, going up this thing doing, like, seven miles. <laughs> like, I could have walked quicker than Gertie was going. <laughs> And I did not make anybody in L.A. mad uh, or everybody. Like, yeah. I'm sure they were talking about me on their like, news that night. Yeah, Some it was idiot. Instagram, otherwise you would have been all <laughs> oh, over it. Oh, man, that. I would have been all over yeah. it. Who's this idiot? Uh, <laughs> and so I pulled in to the parking lot of the church Saturday night, like late. Uh, and I had to speak the next morning. And so. So you made it. Barely. I made it. Barely. And I got there, and the pastor of the church heard what had been going on, and he goes, I want you to tell the story of your wheels, your bi- your bicycle wheels. And I didn't really want to do that, because I'm like, I don't want this to be about me. I want this to be about what, how they can make a difference in the world. Yeah. And he, but, he, but he was the one who had me speaking, and so I said, okay, I'll share it, share it real quick. And so I went up at the beginning of my message, and I held up one of the wheels. And I said, this is what happened. I said, our, our, our thing broke. The wheels got messed up. But you know what? It's no big deal. God's got it handled, and he got me here. Let's go. And that's all I said. Literally, it was like 10 seconds. And you had no bike I, at I, this point. I, yeah, I, I had four bikes, but no yeah, wheels. No I, mean, so they were, I had really uncomfortable seats is what I had. <laughs> and, uh, and, so I just, and so I spoke and I did my message. 
at the end of the message, I'm outside by the RV and I'm talking to different people from the church. They're just thanking me for coming and stuff like that. And as I'm talking to them, this guy walks up and he's carrying two bicycle wheels. And he walks up and says, Johnny, I want you to have these. Mm-hmm. And I go, wow, thank you. And I go, these are awesome. I'm like, thank you so much. And I'm looking, these are really, really awesome. What, do you know what you just gave me? And he goes, yeah. He had this big, dumb, goofy grin on his face. He's like, yeah. And I go, these are Mavic Cosmic Carbone Carbon Tubular Wheels, which means absolutely nothing to most everybody. This is like a $4,300 set of bicycle wheels. Whoa. Like an insane set of bicycle wheels. No, they're used, but they're insane. And I go, these are the same kind that, like, like Lance Armstrong and this is like pre Lance getting in trouble for everything. But yeah. this, these are like the same kind that he, or, or these are like Tour de France wheels. And he goes, yeah, those were, those are Robbie Ventura's wheels. And I go, you mean they're the same kind of wheels that Robbie Ventura rides? And he goes, no, those were Robbie Ventura's wheels. Wow. And I went, Robbie Ventura is the guy who rides with Lance. He's the guy who's rode with Lance for like three of his Tour de France when he's went on his team on the U.S. Postal Service team. And he goes, yeah. And I go, he, he doesn't ride anymore, and he's, he's the guy who does the color commentary on TV for the Tour de France now. Like, if you listen, watch the Tour de France, he's the guy who's talking. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. I go, these were his wheels? And he goes, yeah. I go, so these wheels? He goes, yeah, those wheels rolled in the Tour de France. No <laughs> and <way>. I went, what? <laughs> and he's like, a few months ago, I went to a Livestrong event, and they had a... Uh, 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 auction and one of the auction items was Robbie Ventura's bike and it's hanging on the wall in my office and he had gone home after church and pulled the wheels off of it and brought them back for me mm. and as I'm thanking him he says uh, as I'm thanking him another guy walks up and says hey Johnny I want I want to take you to the bike shop and I want to get you some stuff and I go alright and so he takes me to a bike shop and we walk in and there's like a row of wheels and he said let's get you some wheels I'm going to buy you two sets of wheels today wow. and I went okay and it went from like most expensive to cheapest. And I wanted the most expensive ones because that's what everybody wants. You know, uh, nobody chooses like the, the John boat, you know, <laughs> everybody, everybody, everybody Toyota wants the, yeah. Or the Toyota dolphin. Yeah. And so, uh, I, I, but, but I don't, I know he's buying these for me, so I don't pick the most expensive. I went like one down, uh, <laughs> and he bought me two sets of like the next most expensive ones. Man. While I'm there, the bike shop owner is there. He hears what's going on. Here's my story. And he says, uh, I want to give you another set of wheels. So he gives me another set, a third set. And he says, and here's a spare one we have laying around. It'll fit your bike. It doesn't match any your ones, but just in case you have another break, you have a spare. And I'm like, whoa. And, uh, and so that afternoon, I went back to the pastor's house, and we're hanging out. Uh, and the doorbell rings or knocks or whatever. And the guy who had brought me the Robbie Ventura wheels is back at the door. And he's holding another set of wheels. And I go, what the heck? And he says, I, I got, gave you those, but I really felt like you needed a good set that weren't so expensive, but that were still really good. And so I went and bought you these. And he holds up the set that was the most expensive ones that I didn't pick. Yeah. And he also says, I also got this. And it was a rubber made bin, like a giant, one of those big ones with the lid on it. And he said, this is just some gear you may need. And he'd gone to the bike shop and filled it. I mean, over like to the top, like crammed in there with brake cables and, and grip tape and all this stuff. Cut. Like, if, if I go a week before, and now this story's, I'm, I'm getting almost done. Uh, a week before I, I had been sitting in my dad's living room because I didn't have a house or an apartment or anything. I had a dolphin to live in. <laughs> And uh, I'm sitting there, and I told him, I said, I really wish I had a carbon seat post on my bike. They flex more, means it's more comfortable. And they're only like 90 bucks, but I couldn't afford it. I just couldn't afford it. And I said, I'll just have to ride on a, on a metal seat post. And I was looking through a magazine. I said, that's the one I wish I could get, but I just can't afford it. A week later, I'm standing in the living room of this pastor's house, and I open up this plastic bin, and sitting on top is the exact seat post that wow. I had pointed out to my dad a week ago. I wish I had, I just said, I wish I had it. 
two days later, I'm in another town in Bakersfield, California. I think Bakersfield is where I was or Vesalia, somewhere, one of those other towns. And uh, I haven't talked, I haven't been talking about what had been going on with the RV or anything. So I went, I went from eight wheels that were okay to 11 wheels that were unbelievably good. Yeah. I went from having no extra gear to having, I still, I still have some stuff in that Rubbermaid bin that I still haven't used. Wow. You know, a decade later, just because it, you know, there was so much. Two days later, I'm in this town and I'm speaking at a youth group with a bunch of teenagers. And at the end of the service, I'm outside and this, this teenage girl walks up to me and she's crying. And she's like, I really, what you said tonight made me, it changed my heart. I feel like I need to make a difference in the world. I want to go and make a difference uh, to the impoverished nations over in Africa. I want to go make a difference over there. And I said, that's awesome. That's awesome. Praise God. That's cool. And a few minutes later, uh, this grown man walks up to me. He's crying. And I'm like, you're not, you weren't in youth group. <laughs> you're, a, you're an old dude. And uh, he's crying. And he walks up and he says, that was my daughter. Mm. And I've been praying that God would just open up to her and show her that she has something to offer the world. Because everybody has something to offer the world. Everybody does. Yeah. And he says, I own a shop here in town. Do you care? He's like, I can't offer you a lot, but do you care if I give you guys a free oil change? And I'm like, sure. You know, I don't say anything about what the needs are, but like, I'm like, I'll take an oil change, whatever. You know, you can it's not going to make the car, the van run any worse. You know, <laughs> that night he went home and he read our blog and there was a post about what had happened to the RV. I didn't say anything at church. I didn't talk about it at all to him or anybody. He read about it. And the next morning we took the Toyota Dolphin over to his shop and, and, uh, he said, I said, here, you hear the keys. He goes, well, I'm going to, it'll take a few minutes. Let me take it around back. Uh, why don't you guys go grab lunch across the street? And, uh, so we go across the street and I come back after about an hour and, uh, he says, it's not ready yet. Can you bring it back this afternoon? And I go, well, we really need to get on the road. So now he's like an inconvenience. Yeah. Almost. I'm like, we really need to get on the road. And, and he looked at me and said, no, Johnny. He goes, Johnny, th there's only two transmissions in the country that'll fit your RV. And one of them's going to be here this afternoon. Uh, and so for three days, he put us up in his house and fed us. And I'm not joking. He fed us like lobster and steak, which was awesome. <laughs> and uh, at the end of those three days, I go to pick up the RV and I'm thinking he just changed the transmission. And he hands me a, what was an invoice and it was 11 pages long. They, he had told his guys to do everything. So far as they found a nail in one of my tires, it wasn't leaking, but they found it. So they patched it. They changed all my turn signal bulbs because they were about to go out. They changed my wiper blades, every ounce of fluid, every belt, uh, Freon, everything that they could do in my RV in three days and while the transmission was getting done, they did. Everything. 11-page invoice. And I turned to the back and it said, zero dollars mm. due. And that was the first week of my bicycle tour whenever I decided to do the thing that I really felt God leading me to do, which was scary and nerve wracking, but it was also just a moment of me going, God, you're real. You, you wanted me to do something to make a difference. Just like he wants all of us. To, I mean, God made every single one of us, you know, if you're watching this, God, God made, he made you on purpose. Like you may feel like you're alone. You may feel depressed, but he made you on purpose. He made you for a purpose. Uh, and you might not have found that yet. Uh, or maybe you know what it is and you've just sort of not done it. Maybe it's scary. And maybe it's really scary. Maybe it, maybe it's not living in a Toyota Dolphin, but, but the best way that I can, cause there's no, I can't point to like a, a science book and say, Hey, this is why God's real. But I can point to my life and say, I was broken. I was jacked up. And, he loved me enough in the middle of that to put my life in the right place. I was stuck on the highway with a broken RV and no bikes. 
and, and no he, money. And no money. <laughs> and he loved me enough to say, no, I'm real. I asked you to do this. I asked you to, to, to learn about me and to, to, to tell people about me. Uh, you know, so when people ask if I believe in God, yes, wholeheartedly. There's absolutely no question in my mind. Because uh, he's been real to me. He's been real in my life. And, and, and that might not be the most definitive answer for everybody, but it, it requires faith. I mean, it requires just sort of saying, hey, I believe. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to believe. Uh, and we, we have faith and believe in things every day that we don't know about. Uh, you know, uh, we, we do. Every single day, we, we have faith that our car is going to start. Oh, well, this, hopefully. Is, this is recording right now. Right? This is recording right <laughs> now. Um, we have faith. You know, I have faith that the day I, I had faith the day I asked my wife to marry me that she would say yes. You know, um, and, and, and sometimes things don't turn out the way we want to. And that doesn't mean that God's not real. It just, it, it just means that, that, that we live in a broken world. Things are going to be messed up sometimes, but in the midst of it, God's still real. He still loves you. And, and he still wants you to love him back. That's really what he wants. I mean, there's a reason why the, you know, throughout the Bible, they call God the father because mm-hmm just like a dad, like you just want your kids to love you. You know, we're all broken. We're all messed up. Like I, you know, I told you earlier, like I had to, I had to ask my four-year-old for forgiveness this week. Like I had to say, I was sorry to my four-year-old. I'm like, I'm sorry, buddy. Like daddy got aggravated. You know, he got a little loud. He shouldn't have. Cause I screw up. I mess up. But the thing I want most from him is just him to love me. Like there's even when he messes up, the best thing in the world is when he hugs me and says, I love you. And, um, and it's real. That love is real, and I, I, I believe that because I have faith in the same way that I have faith that God's love for me is real because I've seen it. I've experienced it. And what I've, from your story and what I've, I've experienced in my life, mm-hmm. I feel like every time that there is a tough point, you know, uh, in your case, I mean, a really tough, like, lost. I mean, you're literally in the desert, lost, <laughs> with no money, that usually God is preparing you for something big. He's usually preparing you for something that's going to come next, and it's going to test. Yeah, you, you for just sure. It's going to test your faith. It's going to test your strength. Yeah, oh, I mean, over the course of the next nine months, I rode my bicycle about twelve thousand miles. But in the course of those twelve thousand miles, I spoke at over uh, I think one hundred and sixty churches, and I got to speak to uh, well over a hundred thousand people about how if they just decided to step out and get a little uncomfortable that they can make a difference. Yeah. Um, I still get messages and this was a decade ago. I still get messages. I'm still Facebook friends with some of these people and they're in their twenties now, but they were teenagers wow. back then. And they messaged me about what they're doing. Some of them are pastors. Some of them are, 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 uh, you know, lawyers or doctors or, uh, you know, you know, uh, mechanics or whatever, but they're making a difference where they are, where God put them, because God made them for a purpose. And that purpose isn't for everybody to be a pastor. That purpose is for everybody to love God and love others the way that God loves them. Yeah. I mean, that's, and, and, and they're doing that and I still get to experience that. And so had I quit, that's a hundred thousand people that I wouldn't have been able to speak life into. Mm. Um, the and next, right now, you wouldn't be. On I here. wouldn't be doing this right here. I wouldn't be a pastor. You know, I pro- I don't know if I'd be a pastor still. I I don't know if I would have married my wife. I don't know where life would have gone. Um, but it was just making that step of saying, saying, "Hey, you know what? I have faith that God, you're real, because you've been real in my life every other step of the way, and He's taking care of me." I mean, I can look at m- what we're doing now with our church. I mean, we we I planted this church. I started this church that I'm at um, five years ago. And this week was five years. Oh wow. Um, and we're We've been portable, so we've been meet, like setting up and tearing down every week, and we're about to step into a permanent building for the first time. A lot of faith and a lot of moments that are nerve-wracking where I'm like going, okay, God, are you going to handle this? You know, a lot of uh, a lot of moving parts to get in there, and every time he just sort of comes through. Um, it's just sort of taking that step to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to let you. I can't say that you're God and I believe in you and not let you be God. Yeah. I'm going to just let you be God. And let you do it. I'm going to do the best I can. And, um, you know, and, and, and he does want to use you to make a difference in the world. And he does. And he doesn't make mistakes. He, he doesn't, you know. He doesn't make mistakes right where you're at. You know, he, 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 he loves you. And, and you may not know it, but the mistakes that you've made do not uh, 
and negate what God wants to do through you and with you. In fact, if anything, they, they, they enhance it. You know, if you look through, you know, the Bible, like every one of them screwed up way bigger than probably anybody that's yeah. listening or watching this, you know, you know, you, you go back to the old Testament, King David committed murder so that he could steal a man's wife. Like most of us haven't done that. <laughs> so hopefully not. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, but if you have, I hope, I hope you're hearing everything I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> you know, everybody, you know, Paul who wrote two thirds of the new Testament of the Bible was a murderer of Christians. It's what he did yeah. like for sport. Uh, he murdered Christians and he wrote two thirds of the Bible after God changed him. Like we're all, we are all jacked up. We're people We're yeah. broken yeah. and I'm a pastor and I'm jacked up and I am broken. Uh, and, and the, the only good stuff in me comes from God. That's just what it is, you know, and, mm-hmm. and he makes me the person I am. And, and, and you know, because, uh, you know, even now, I mean, there are moments, you know, whenever I get aggravated or angry and, and sort of the me, me starts breaking through and says, I don't want to listen to you, God, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's when I yell at my kid or I get mad and cuss at somebody in traffic. Like that's, that's when that happens. The rest of the time we're being real here, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm just, you know, it's just yeah. me, but. You know, that's when it happens is whenever you, when, when, when the old you starts breaking through and God says, no, 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 I love you. I love you. Just love me and, 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 and try your best to live for me the way you can. Mm. And, uh, and that's, that's what I try to do every day. I love it, man. Yeah. All right. Well, I had a whole list of things to cover and how God seems to change the script sometimes. Well, that's next so. time. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. So I, I think... The, the big takeaway here, uh, it, I, let's just focus on that one that one chapter in Jeremiah. I, if for someone watching this, that is exactly what you need to hear. And I didn't even know we were going to go down that route. I and didn't either. I, I yes. think that's, to me, that's what someone needs to hear. I think I personally need to hear that as well. And so all we ask, and really the ultimate goal here is is to spread this word, is to, is to do more of these. And if you love this, if this made an impact on you, then, then share it. That's all we ask. Share it with yeah. someone who might need to hear this message. Um, and, and obviously subscribe to us, like us. And then the final, final piece of this is we're not a church. We're not going to take tithes. Th- this is just something that we are called to do. My ultimate goal with it is to once again, inspire people to give hope. And then finally, to move you along that journey to go find a church. Yeah. You know, the church, at the end of the day, it can happen like this. The, the church was never something that had to happen in a building with a steeple, right? No. And I think that's a big misconception. The church is people. And the one thing you mentioned earlier, I think it's one of the biggest issues facing America is loneliness, mm-hmm. right? So many of us are lonely. I mean, including people like me who have a wife and kids, but I know there's times when I just, I feel I feel lonely, and it's usually when I've ignored a lot of signs from God. I'm not praying as much. So I would encourage you to find a church. Yep. They're not all created equal. Some are different, but there is a church, I believe, for every person, right? I mean, There is. Yes. You know, there's, and there's every kind of church. If you like traditional music, you're going to find one like that. If you want one that feels more like a rock and roll show, they're, they're out there too, yep. uh, or everything in between. Uh, and, and, and I think so often we equate... Uh, while the church is there to represent God, uh, past pains or hurts from a church, we go, well, I'm hurt. God hurt me. It, well, no, people hurt you. Um, and they did it maybe in the name of God, but, but that's, you know, it's neither here nor there. You know, it's just, God still loves you and he's not the one who hurt you. It's, it, you know, people might have done it and they might've done it whilst using his name, but, but I would encourage you to, to find one. Uh, and if you don't find the right one first, check out other ones. But when you find one, here's the biggest point is, is don't be somebody that that is always just jumping around. Find one and like dig in, like find one and go, I'm going to give it three months. I'm going to give it six months and I'm going to hang out and I'm going to see if I can find a community of people. Like that's one, for me, one of my favorite parts of Salt Strong, I love learning. I love making fun of him, catching catfish. Uh, (laughs) But uh, but one of my favorite parts is just community. Yeah. Like I have a group of buddies and friends that I go fishing with, you know, and I get to talk to and text message and we Facebook or whatever that I get to hang out with. And and, and it's a great community. And in, in the same way that the church is a great yeah. community. Um, and, and, and so 
I would encourage you to, to find one that you like, um, or find a, a place where you go, you know what? I really feel like when you find the one that maybe, maybe it's not even necessarily the one that you would go, Hey, this is the one I like the best, but it's the one you walk into and you go, I feel like this is where God wants me to be, mm-hmm. you know? And it might just be a feeling. It might be a thought. It might be one that you go and no, I love this place. I want to stay and you just, you, you just, just try one and find it and just go, Hey, I'm going to give it three months. I'm going to give it six months and, and don't just show up five minutes late and leave the second it's over. Like try and meet some people try to get to know some people because there's some great people that want to get to know you there yep. and, uh, and you'll develop a community and you, all of a sudden you have somebody that when you're walking through hard times that you can talk to in the same way that I know that uh, you or I get message, you know, even from guys in salt strong or other people, we'll get emails or messages going, Hey, you know, pray for me. I'm going through a hard time. You know, I need to talk, whatever that stuff happens. And that's awesome. Uh, but in the same way that you'll have somebody that you can talk to within the church uh, that's there for you, yeah. uh, right there in your town. Whereas, you know, Salt Strong for a lot of times and for a lot of people is sort of spread out around the world. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so find one that you can dig into uh, and, you know, just find a place to, to go visit and have a good time, you know. Yeah, and if someone happens to be in central Florida, Polk County yeah. area. Uh, yeah, we meet in Lakeland. My church is Discover Family Church. Uh, discoverfamilychurch.com. The website's a little dated. We're, we're redoing it right now, but discoverfamilychurch.com. <clears throat> Meeting uh, North Lakeland, like right off I-4. Uh, super easy to get to. Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. Service is a little over an hour. And we have free coffee. Oh, hello. With, with real creamer. None of that powdered garbage. You need to bring uh, the, the, the dolphin back and have <laughs> that as the centerpiece I so- up front. <laughs> I sold that to a guy uh, who is now living in it up in Alabama. Wow. Uh, yeah, and so he, it's his house. He lives in it, and so which is terrifying. Uh, and so, but yeah, so that uh, yeah, Discover Family Church Sunday mornings, ten a.m. We'd love to have you. Yep. Um, if you want any information or Facebook us, you can find us on Facebook. Look up Discover Family Church. Yep, and we will certainly have him back. The guy has a, a, some just really amazing stories, and as you can tell, if you're still here, I mean, super relatable. And um, finally, as, as I mentioned, we're not asking for money, ties. We're not a church. We just want to help inspire you, bring you some hope, and, and you know, just, just share love For out sure. there. I mean, that's kind of what you said. And so if you like this, please share it. Let us know. So my personal email, if you made it this far, joe, J-O-E at saltstrong.com. So joe at saltstrong.com. Shoot me an email. Tell me, uh, tell, tell me if you liked it. Tell me if there's things that we could have changed, if it was too long, too short, uh, other questions you have, other topics that you want us to cover, For and sure. we will do it. Uh, my goal is to do this every Sunday, not to replace church, to get the unchurched eventually into church. So if even if you're a pastor listening to this, the goal is to not to replace church. This is to inspire people and to give them hope that church and having a community of people that, that just want to love on them. This, I mean, these same people that changed your entire life did nothing but love on you, did not yep. try to change you, Mm-mm. did not try to make you feel guilty, did not try to like look at you as, oh, you're a sinner and I'm not. They just loved on you. Yep. And that's really what a good church community can and will do for you. So for that sure. is it. Episode number one of Salt Strong Unchurched, over and out. Right. Thank you, guys. Peace.